I'm going to go ahead and test this. Okay, it's really hot. There we go. All right, we're going to go ahead and get kicked off. I think we're maybe a, well, actually we're a couple minutes early, and that's good, which is pretty odd for this group. Uh, usually we all stand around and yap too much, but welcome. My name is Tom McDougall, president and CEO of High Point Networks. Uh, for those of you who are here in person, we're glad that we had the opportunity to host you today. Uh, finally, after several months of being holed up in our offices or homes or wherever we've been, and, and for a lot of fun, we're really glad to give this a whirl doing a, a dual event where we get to host this online for a bunch of people that are joining us from all over, uh, all over the U.S., so that's awesome. We're going to go through today a product that I'm really excited about. We've been looking for something like this. About two years ago, we did a... Uh, a round table with just about every group of people we work with in several different states and everybody kind of said the same thing. We'd really like to have a service which operates as a security operations center but we don't want to spend all of the time and money it requires to do it on our own. So we started looking for something really good that would fit the needs of our customer base and we found a solution from a company called Arctic Wolf. And we're gonna have Greg and Logan today from Arctic Wolf explain what we're doing there and how exciting it is and how it works. But before we get to them, I wanna introduce our own Dean Sheely. Dean is, uh, does a lot of things in the security world for High Point Networks. I'm not even 100% sure what his title is myself, but I call him for just about anything related to security. And I want Dean to give us a little highlight of what he's working on, what we're working on as a company, and then we'll turn it over to Greg and Logan from there. So, Dean Shealy, and welcome, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. And hey, a, a quick shout out to our very humble owner and founder here, who was awarded with Entrepreneur of the Year in the Fargo, North Dakota area. So, way to go, Tom. Very well deserved. And, you know, 20 years of, of building excellent customer service and, and giving back to the community. So, yeah, my name is uh, Dean Sheely. We're going to be talking about security operations as a service today, SOC as a service, and this special Better Together partnership between High Point Networks and Arctic Wolf. And, of course, Logan and, and Greg are here today to, to help us out with that. So, quickly, uh, Dean Sheely, senior, senior security consultant. I think my title is just security guy. Um, we have a lot of security professionals in High Point Networks. It's really a part of our, our DNA. Anyway, I'm out of our Sioux Falls, South Dakota office. Uh, some creds there, a uh, master's degree in security, CISSP, um, and also former CISO. Some relevant information history specific to today's talk is that I was a SOC analyst for a very successful um, credit card company. Uh, that was experiencing explosive growth. And that was a great opportunity, so I hope I can bring some of that uh, information and perspective to today's talk. Also, when I was a C, uh, CISO, State University System, um, I was a, kind of the lead of a fantastic team of men and women university CISOs where we vetted and purchased and began the implementation of a central security operations center in the state of South Dakota for the university system. So I hope I can bring a little bit of perspective to that uh, fantastic opportunity there. And then lastly, I want you to know that High Point Networks is really unbiased when it comes to doing a traditional security operations center and SOC as a service. As you can see in this image back here, this is a traditional SOC that uh, we helped broker the deal for. Um, and the only reason I'm showing you this picture is because it's public. It was in a newspaper, obviously, we wouldn't show this if it wasn't. Um, but again, if, if SOC is the, traditional SOC is the best fit for you, that's great. If SOC as a service is the best fit, that's great as well. One of my goals by the end of today's presentation is to kind of make you aware of where a delineation might be between the traditional SOC and SOC as a service. You know, the traditional SOC, it's kind of, you know, you need to be a little flexible with your finances, you know, maybe more enterprise-ish and have the human resources and so forth to do that. The SOC as a service, friends, gives you that enterprise type of capability, and I would almost argue that it gives you a little bit even more than that at a fraction of the price, time to value exponentially faster and so forth. So I hope I can bring all of that to, the ta to today's discussion um, to really make it relevant. 
Okay, quick agenda. We're gonna rip through all of these on the top here from tools to the predictable pricing, time to value, and really important, the concierge security team. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on operations because that really makes or breaks a traditional SOC or even SOC as a service, SOC as a service other than Arctic Wolf. And we'll get into that. Um, then Greg and Greg and Logan are going to interject in, in all of those little sections. Then we're also going to have our folks here, our Arctic Wolf guests, talk about war stories to really let you know what they're seeing across the United States and Europe and so forth as they consult with those folks. And then we're going to do, you know, a question and answer as much as much time as that takes. And please, when we're done with today's discussion, that is not the end of our conversation. You can definitely communicate with us. Um, online, visit our website, we have a YouTube channel, and then obviously communicating with your account managers. All right, and then common three theme, and then we'll kick it off here, is operations. And I'm gonna spend about 10 minutes on that because it's so important. And we have this little saying within High Point Networks, and maybe Arctic Wolf would agree with this, but we ask ourselves and we ask our customers, are operations at the center of your security operations center, right? You think it would make sense, but if operations aren't at the center of your security operations center, then you might be a, hmm, we'll let Jeff Foxworthy finish that, right? It's a family-friendly show. But SOC operation center, you have to have operations there. So what are we trying to accomplish with a SOC? Well, SOC is a function. It brings the people, processes, and technology into our NIST life cycle here, you know, where we identify, protect, respond, and recover. The people processes and the technology um, where we're detecting and analyzing and responding. The SOC, especially the SIM component, the Security Information Event Management Platform, is really helping you become an intelligent uh, driven uh, organization by making informed decisions on all of the telemetry that's brought in which then you can hand over to your people and so forth to, uh, to complete operations. Okay, so tools. Here we go. Look at that. Up in the upper left-hand corner, I counted the number of tools in there the other day, and it's right around 125, right? So if you split this into quadrants, you're four or 500 tools, right? We have, you know, network, identity, there's even uh, blockchain, and I mean, you name it, the, the data uh, and so forth, access control there, data security. Now, these tools are fantastic. And a lot of us have a lot of these tools and it's completely justified when you think about defense in depth and layered controls, right? But year after year after year, I found a, a span here of about 10 years. Even with those fantastic tools, risk, incidents, breaches, and so forth continue to rise. And not only that, but we see more of the same, literally more of the same in terms of cost, number of records stolen. Um, the really interesting one here, promised I would never use my laser pointer, is the 245 days to actually realize that the bad guys are in your environment and find out where the breach is at. 245 days, I'm gonna go back to the tools. Come on folks, we can do better than that, right? So what's the deal? Let's get to the point, high point. We don't have a tools problem, folks. We have an effectiveness problem. And Logan and, and Greg, I might have you, uh, yeah, now might be a good time to jump in. So I know Arctic Wolf is kind of observing this as well that we don't necessarily have a tools problem, that it might be an effectiveness problem. Maybe we should focus more on operations, processes and procedures and so forth. Is, is that what you're saying as well? Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, when you look at some of the more notable breaches in history, you know, we look at the target breach, their breach for the, through their HVAC vendor. I think a lot of people know that story. In that instance, um, they went back, they did the forensics post breach. They found out that the tool they were using, the SIM tool they were using that actually caught the breach, they just didn't have anyone respond to the, the data that they were seeing. Um, same thing with Equ Equifax. They, uh, they were doing vulnerability scanning. They knew about a vulnerability. They just didn't take action on it. If they would have, it would have prevented that bad actor from getting in and stealing hundreds of records. Um, 
Uh, Capital One, same thing. There was a misconfiguration in the cloud. So I think there's this over-reliance on tools. It's this set it and forget it mentality and this not continuing to adapt as security evolves over time, as bad actors get more sophisticated in the attacks that they're launching as they you know, become more organized, uh, which we're seeing a lot of on our side. And so you know, the, going back to the tools problem, um, you know, the tools were doing their job. The products were doing their job. They just weren't being utilized properly. And I think that's where we, we missed the mark uh, on the security side is setting it and forgetting it, not updating it, updating it accordingly, and maybe not having the expertise and even knowing what you need to do to configure that device properly. So having you know, that constant monitoring behind the scenes of what's going on to realize when things are misconfigured so you can act accordingly or when there is uh, indicators of compromise within your network that have bypassed those tools so that you're not sitting there for 245 days waiting to see you know what happened um, you actually know what's what's going on behind the scenes and having that operational component in place so absolutely and I totally agree with that and the customers that we speak with they have fantastic men and women that are the administrators of these tools but usually they stretch those folks as far as they can they're overburdened and so forth and Typically, they're working eight to five, right? Monday through Friday. So who's looking at stuff in the evenings? Who's looking at stuff on the weekends? And we're gonna get into that a little bit later. So please, not, not a person problem, but an effectiveness problem, maybe a training problem, maybe just you know, kind of an awareness, eyes on glass type of problem. Okay. Changing gears here a little bit. I wanna tell everybody about the ops oops moment and I almost call this a universal pitfall, okay? And we're just about done with ops, so don't change the channel, folks. We're gonna get to the tech. <laughs> but when I think of a sock, right, a really cool one, you know, that you'd see like in a Jason Bourne movie or something like that, or maybe you'd see at Verizon or AT&T, it kinda looks like this, right? Really cool, you know, you got the, got the world up there and histograms and pie charts and flow charts and all of this other stuff. And then you bring in We'll use a traditional SOC here. You know, you got the security information event management platform, you throw the sensors out there, you got the agents, the threat feeds coming in, case management is ready to rock. And then all of a sudden something happens and nobody noticed. And you're like, well, what the heck is going on? You know, we just spent 500K on a SIM and everything that goes around it. You forget about the operations. And this is the ops, oops moment. And then everybody scrambles. And all of the budget was spent on technology. And it's like, oh my goodness, we need ops. So what do if, what if folks do? They're like, oh geez, let's send John Doe and Sally Smith and a few other people to training. And they'll come back to be SOC experts. No, that's not how it works. You spent 500K on a SIM, right? You're gonna take five people for $5,000 and send them to five days of training. And then you hope they'll come back and be five-star SOC analysts giving each other a high five. It doesn't happen like that. It's not fair to John Doe or Sally Smith. So what Arctic Wolf does is they've taken the operational component and they put it on top. So not only are they the SOC as a service leader in the industry, they are the cyber operations leader in the industry. And the operations consist of, and we're gonna go through a lot of these, the concierge security team, team who are personal, you get to know, first name basis, cyber responders. They're there 24 seven, they're gonna take care of the tuning, the, the custom configuration, and then when something happens, they're gonna you know, guide you through the remediation process, find root cause, and, and do all of that. And then there's something that I call the force multiplier. And this is the better together relationship between Arctic Wolf and High Point Networks. But in addition to the tech, in addition to the operations, you get High Point Networks behind you, who consist of fantastic account managers, customer service, engineers, consultants, project managers, and so forth. You know, in basketball, we would call three things like this kind of a, a triple threat. This is a stack of security, reliability, and availability that usually only enterprises with deep pockets can afford. And of course, you get a small army of people behind you 
Arctic Wolf and High Point networks. And we, I don't know how big our enterprise is today, 150, 175, I don't know, we're growing, you know, like weekly. So there are folks behind you. And one more point on ops, and then I promise we'll move on. I call this the ops oops insanity. So remember when I was talking about the traditional SOC and how people all of a sudden notice that, oops, we forgot operations? Well, a lot of times people don't even get that. They think it's the technology that's not working. So what they do is they end up purchasing, I mean, specifically SIM, which is kind of difficult to even purchase and deploy and all of that operate, and all of the components around it, continuous threat and so forth. And it's not working out for them. The CFO is kind of upset. The board is wondering what the heck is going on. So in a panic, what happens is they'll ditch that entire stack, stack of technology, and they'll bring a new stack of technology in from a different vendor, and they will experience the same problem again. I've seen this happen quite a bit, actually. I don't know, do you, do you guys see, I didn't mean to just kind of flash over here and put you on the hook, but have you kind of heard of, of stories like that as well? Greg or Logan? Yeah, from an agnostic standpoint, we're, we're very vendor agnostic. Um, that, that's more of a, a platform conversation when they're switching out all the, the technology. But that is one of the benefits. We're gonna work really nicely with what you have in place. Um, it is one of the benefits of owning your own tech stack. Also, we control our own destiny there. Um, so I know there's a lot of, uh, you know, partners, service providers, uh, and manufacturers out there uh, that are offering a service like this, and it sounds apples to apples, but that's always going to be a big question. Do you own your tech stack? Do we get dedicated resources? Um, so we're definitely, we're definitely seeing that, but uh, we, we help avoid that challenge. Yeah, just to add to that, too, I think, you know, we're people switching out one technology for another, I think the benefit of having... Um, you know, Arctic Wolf and High Point behind you is we're, we're showing you where people are getting in, we're showing you where the products are failing, so you don't have to take a guess at, hey, maybe this one didn't work right, let's just put another one in there and hope that works, another firewall, another endpoint, whatever it might be. We can show you where the threat came in, we can tell you how it got in, where it came in, why it got in, and so that really helps you make that next technology decision because it's a much more informed decision, uh, because you know what's going on behind the scenes, you can see what's happening, and that security expertise is guiding you along the way where and we're not telling you to purchase a Palo Alto, whatever it might be, a certain vendor, but we can tell you this isn't working correctly. It either needs to be reconfigured or you need to look at additional technologies to shore up your security posture. Absolutely, very good. Okay, so let's move on to kind of the stack that they were talking about here. Uh, it starts with the foundation, right? So you start bringing in all of this telemetry and you have, you know, endpoints and mobile devices and everything in the cloud and whatnot. And again, they are vendor, vendor neutral, I think is what the term is. So you can see there's AWS and Azure and it doesn't matter if it's Palo Alto or something else. It all comes in. And the principle of this is that, you know, you think about the, the SANS uh, uh, 20 critical controls, right? Number one is know what you have. And the reason for that is you can't protect what you have unless you know what you have. So this is kind of the first spot, bringing all of that telemetry in, identifying all of your devices. And then there's something I call the 24-7, 365, 360, okay? So you need to know about all of your assets and you need to be able to see where the attacker is hitting you in a 360 degree way, 24-7, 365, day or night, right? The military calls this situational awareness. Okay, on top of that, we put, let me go back one, we put the platform. And the platform is really where all of the intelligence happens, right? This is data enrichment, correlation of events and analysis. This is where AI and ML and user behavior analytics and all of that takes place to supplement the Arctic Wolf uh, team and expertise. That team is the concierge security team, and we're gonna get into this a little bit more in a second, but this is the game changer, this is the differentiator, this is the disruptor in the industry. It's radically personalized security service. Personalized in that you actually get to know the folks on a first name basis, and we're gonna get to, into that in a little bit later. But tactical stuff, strategic consulting, they become an extension of your team, 
helps remove the alert fatigue and the 24-7, 365. And then on top of that, right, the icing on the cake, got to have it, make or break, is the security operations. And this is where the folks actually, you know, this is where the magic happens, right? So quickly detect, not 240 some days while somebody's knocking on your doors or in your environment. Uh, continuous uh, threat risk assessment. Um, discover benchmarking, hardening, hardening, and so forth. And then obviously, as people perhaps transition to the cloud, whatever is right for your organization, everything in the cloud is monitored as well. AWS, Azure, G Suite, doesn't matter. So just to kind of put this together graphically, you've got the technology. On top of that, you have the people and the processes. And then on top of that, you have the processes and procedures. And what's beautiful in this, as compared to maybe a traditional build-it-yourself type of sock, is in the, in the do-it-yourself, you might have a SIM that's from one vendor. You might have continuous threat that's from another. You might have threat feeds coming in from somewhere else. You might have uh, endpoint that's, and you have to try to glue that together, right? Now, maybe someday. But not today. There's no way that you can build or beat a vertically integrated system of systems, rapid response stack, right? System of systems. And you as the customer, here's just a few examples of the rich interface that you as a customer, that you as an end, end user can see. You can get involved as much as you want to or as little as you want to, right? Just some examples of that. So, Anyway, again, vertically integrated, a system of systems, rapid. So I want to drive this home with an analogy. Can anybody else think of something that operates that way or something that, that looks that way, a product? Well, I'll show you what it is. It's a Big Mac, right? It's a stack. It's vertically integrated. It comes to you rapidly. And that's humorous, right? But in the real world, there's nothing more perfect and beautiful as far as a machine goes than the human body. And when you think about the sympathetic nervous system, right, it operates like sock as a service. Through your pupils, you, you perceive a threat, you analyze that, and your cardiovascular kicks in, your respiratory, your endocrinology kicks in, and it all happens in the blink of an eye and you don't even think about it. It's, it's they call it auto, autotomic or something like that. Vertically integrated, a system of systems, and it's rapid. Imagine if it didn't function that way. If it didn't, you'd get you know, eaten by an animal or something like that before you realized what's going on. The same thing happens in the security world. You just don't have time to, to mess around with it. Okay, I want to get into pricing because this is something that I experienced personally, and I think I'll ask Logan and Greg to, to opine on this too here in a second. But metaphorically, if you can see that equation on that 10-foot chalkboard, that's what the equation kind of looks like when you're designing your own sock. And you're going to have to explain how you came to that conclusion to your CFO someday, right? So buckle your seatbelt for that. You know, with the do-it-yourself sim, a lot of it is kind of based around events per second that come in or data ingestion that comes in during the day and then you calculate that at the end of the night. You know, you might have different kinds of sensors, add-on components, the AI, NetFlow, process monitoring. And what I experienced is, especially the SIM component, when you purchase licensing stuff for that, licenses, you need to make sure that you're compliant throughout the year. In other words, you don't want to do more events per second or have more event storage at the end of the day. So you, you have to figure that out. And it's just the swag, right? Trying to forecast that because nobody really knows until you get the solution in your environment. So you end up buying high to make sure you, you stay in compliance with your licenses. And then if you're a university system, if you're a credit card processor whose busiest time you know is November through January, if you're 1-800-Flowers where your busiest time during the year is during Valentine's Day, you might experience these huge peaks and then valleys, right, for the rest of the year. But you need to purchase up front those licenses to stay in compliance, and then you're committed, right, for three years, five years. 
Um, so this is the difficulty that kind of comes around, you know, do it yourself, um, build your own sock, especially the sim component. So the Arctic Wolf guys came up with something called predictable pricing because they know that the folks that have been through this before, how painful it is. And I kind of have a kindergarten abacus over here just to give you an idea of how simple it is. So we got the little abacus guy there, and really there's only kind of five factors here. You know, it's how many servers, how many employees, how many cloud apps, how many egress points, and how many workstations done full stop. How easy is that to explain to your CFO? Do you kind of mind expanding a little bit on the predictable pricing? So, you know, one thing about, you know, kind of the variable costs, uh, as Dean said, is it's, it's just hard to, to predict, and, and managing a sim is, is hard enough. So, um, we also didn't want it to be, when we were putting together our pricing model, a, a conversation of, do we cover this asset, or can we afford it? Um, because that really goes against having a, an effective security operations practice in place. Uh, for us, that starts with broad visibility. That's looking at everything. So um, if we're outweighing cost and, and assets, that, that's a conflict there. Also, if we're making recommendations on, you know, maybe another security tool uh, to shore up your security posture, uh, thus creating a log source, we didn't want it to be a double-edged sword there. So um, predictable pricing based on threat surface, so primarily users and servers. So we're gonna to wanna to understand that. Um, there are a few other components, uh, the sensor component in any cloud applications we're gonna to wanna to know about. Um, but outside of that, once we have you sized correctly, everything's very inclusive. So I know Dean has a few of the, the bullet points up here, um, but that's, that's the really an important part because a lot of, historically a lot of vendors have priced uh, in one of these buckets. So we do it uh, unique, unique from that aspect. Anything you want to add? Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, when we talk to customers, a lot of them that have a SIM today that have gone down the path of do-it-yourself, what we hear from them is, you know, there's certain points of time, like Dean mentioned during the year, that we have to decide what do we want to actually send to the SIM. We can't afford it. We didn't have it in budget. It spiked. Our cost has doubled uh, over the last six months. So now they're to a point where... I can't send this data, I have to pick and choose what's sent, and at that point, you don't have an effective you know, security operations. You're not, you're not seeing everything. If you're only monitoring the front door, odds are someone's gonna sneak in the back. So we didn't wanna put our customers in that box. We wanted to make it easy for them to digest and not have it fluctuate uh, to make sure we're ingesting everything and we're covering all the, the avenues that someone could get in, and for us, if you could, as many logs as you can send us, we wanna take them in. So we don't limit the amount of data that we're taking in by any means. We don't care how many devices you have. We don't charge based off of that, but we still cover them and monitor them. That's a question we get all the time. Well, if you're not pricing based on this, do you still cover this? The answer is yes. Uh, we just wanted to break down the pricing in an easy, predictable manner that's easy to digest, easy to understand, uh, and easy to predict long-term what your cost might be as you grow as a company. Absolutely, and if you need to scale the thing, don't worry about it, right? If it's the traditional do-it-yourself sock, you may need to bring you know, more compute, storage, memory in, people, there's maintenance and all of that stuff. If you're in an explosive, rapidly growing business, you don't want your security operations or your infrastructure to actually become a business risk because you can't scale it as fast as your business is growing, right? With Arctic Wolf, there's no data retention limit, right? An auditor says, hey, this year we want you to keep things for 13 months. Next year we want it to keep, you know, keep it for 24 or 36 months, right? Good luck doing that with the traditional do-it-yourself sock or sim solution. These guys, I don't want to say, <laughs> I don't want to say unlimited capacity, but it's just kind of, I don't know, does it even require a phone call or does it just kind of happen? Or, you know, if you want to scale, how, do, how does that work? Yeah, it's something that, you know, we would revisit on an annual basis or depending on what the contract looks like. You know, obviously, if you've got, you know, a user or two, a server or two being added, we're not going to factor that in. The only time we'd really look at it, if you're acquiring a company and you're adding 50, 100 users, you're building out another location, that's when we'd revisit it and true it up on, upon the renewal. So, um, easy to scale. It's a you know, phone call away, and we're not nickel and diming you on the, the various users and servers that you might bring on, you know, onesies, twosies here and there. Uh, we're really looking at the, the broad scope of it, um, and, you know, we're, we're basing it on the attack surface on the assumption that a user is going to generate a certain amount of traffic, a server is going to generate a certain amount of traffic. 
and um, so price accordingly, and then as you scale, obviously that attack surface increases, um, so pricing accordingly as, as you scale as a company. Awesome. Such a breath of fresh air, the affordable, predictable pricing. Okay, switching gears, kind of hard again, compliance. A lot of regulatory obligations, you know, and financial, medical, uh, critical infrastructure, things like that are highly suggesting that you have specifically the SIM component, but a security operations center, right? Because they want that 24-7 uh, 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 visibility, if you will, um, continuous assessment, threat assessment, response, and then they want everything aggregated and, and audited and, and, you know, check and verify type of form later on. So right here are some of the, the popular ones, right? We've got cards, medical, bank, uh, manufacturing, education, and data privacy, GDPR, California, and New York now, right? And there's many more. There's NERC and so forth. I want to show you something that Arctic Wolf recently helped us out with. Uh, we have a, a customer that's a defense contractor, right? And they were curious, you know, kind of how Arctic Wolf would, would fit into their environment, helping them meet their compliance needs. Now, this is not just check the box, right? This is check the box with operations, right? Remember how important that is. Because if you have the tech, that doesn't cut it. You need the operations behind it as well. The light green, okay, so this is NIST 171, and anybody that knows about that, it's kind of a bear cat, right? Defense contractor, they want to make sure that you kind of have semi-military grade security going on. Each one of these is a family or a section of a security control, if you will. The light green is where Arctic Wolf significantly met the requirement of that, um, that section, if you will. The dark green is where Arctic Wolf completely met the requirement of NIST 171. And the beautiful thing about this, right, is that if you go out to Arctic Wolf's website today, you can look for that type of stuff, not spreadsheeted out, I did that, but you can look at PCI and 171 and FFIC and so forth, and they will spell out each section that Arctic Wolf kind of addresses. And I really liked that part of your website. So can you talk maybe about how customers are talking about compliance and how SOC as a service helps meet that, that obligation quickly? Yeah, and I think um, when you look at a lot of the compliance regulations and what we're seeing a lot of too uh, from our customers is the third party compliance where it's maybe not mm. that your uh, organization has to adhere to HIPAA, has to adhere to PCI, right. but they're being pushed down in, in the companies that we work with and we go back to the target breach, they were breached through their HVAC vendor. They want to know that the, the vendors that they're working with adhere to the same compliance regulations that they do because they don't want to be the weak link in the chain and I think um, for a lot of organizations, especially with small IT teams, it's really hard to do 24 by 7 monitoring. It's really hard to do log aggregation and put the operational component behind it. So when you're being told through PCI, through HIPAA, that you have to do that or that you have to report on a breach very quickly when it happens or you're subject to a fine, um, it's, it's hard to do. It's, it's almost impossible to do unless mm -hmm. you look and outsource it through someone like an Arctic Wolf. And, I would say on the, the compliance piece too, that's another area where we help a lot of companies out. Uh, we actually provide audit support. So not only will we provide you a, a physical report or a virtual copy of a report of how we check those boxes for you, if you have an audit coming up, we'll actually get on with your auditor and walk through that report with them mm -hmm. and show them exactly, here's how X organization is meeting these controls. So it's off of your plate. We know you guys have to fill out the, the forms upon forms, uh, but when it comes to security, they can just go talk to uh, Steve or Eugene on the Arctic Wolf team, and they can and have that conversation with them. So you're so you're meeting those regulations and not having to talk to it, knowing that we're having these conversations every day with auditors. Awesome, that's fantastic. It's a huge driver in today's day and age, and as we all know, uh, new legislation, statutory, regulatory requirements seem like they're coming out constantly. Okay, guys, get ready for this one: the staffing challenge. Okay. Now I want to drive this home with a metaphor, so I kind of have like a corny picture here, all right? So, so bear with me. The corny picture is actually a unicorn. Okay, why? And I know that's silly, but you're not going to forget the unicorn. A SOC analyst, a SOC operator is a very special employee, right? They can see patterns of the chaos. They're kind of, they're kind of magical. They're kind of hard to find and so forth. And you know, once you find one, you got you to keep them happy, right? 
They're multidisciplined, they're experienced, they're expensive, they're hard to find. Expensive. I went to like Glassdoor the other day to look at, you know, like an, an average ordinary kind of like SOC analyst, SOC operator. I was shocked by how much, well, maybe not super shocked, right? But they're hard to retain too. You will be told when you buy a traditional SOC SIM solution that, hey, AI, ML, user behavior analytics, and all of that kind of automatic stuff is going to save the day, right? So maybe you don't need a unicorn anymore, right? Maybe that'll take care of it. But how many times have any of us had like an Alexa or even spell check, right, screw up on a daily basis? And you're going to tell us when you have thousands of logs coming in per second that that's going to be able to kind of make sense of the chaos. And it kind of does to a certain extent. To a certain extent. Is the AI there today? Kind of. Will it be, you know, mature 10 years from now? Probably absolutely. But be very cognizant of that. Again, you need the people. You need the operations. You need the unicorns. And when you're shopping for a unicorn on LinkedIn, just keep in mind that if you're going to have a 24-7, 365 shop, which you need, because when it's the middle of the night here, folks, it's the middle of the day somewhere else, right? And hackers don't want to work at night. Right? That's when you're going to get hit. So you will need more than one unicorn if you're going to be a 24-7 shop. And buyer beware, don't be fooled by the imitation unicorn. You got to be really careful. So can you guys take a second and hit on staffing and the, the difficulties around that? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this is a challenge that is articulated to us very often. Um, you know, not having a security resource, not being 24 by 7. Uh, you know, for a company that's 50, 100 users, 200 users, even 1,000 users to go out and hire one, two, three resources, it, it's not, not attainable. And then to Dean's point, to retain them, train them, it's ineffective. Um, and the human element is a very important aspect of having effective security operations in place. It's the technology, the people, and the process. So we actually dedicate a team to each of our clients. Um, and tactically, if there's a security incident, we're going to be doing the, the blocking and tackling and running that to ground. Uh, but I think equally import as important, there's the familiarity aspect where, where when you're having those continuous improvement conversations or looking at your security posture, or even if there is a security incident, you're talking with someone that understands your environment and your business risks, um, almost like you pick up the phone and, and you're calling someone remotely that you work with. So um, that is how we interface uh, with, our, with our clients, with our partners, uh, is with people, rather than um, having you guys go into to a tool and try and do this, do this yourself. Um, and to the, the point on compliance, that's where having that team is, is gonna come into play. Yeah, and I just say, you know, there's, when you, when you talk about security people and hiring them on and maybe going and finding that one unicorn, what we see is there's a lot of burnout. Uh, those guys are overtaxed. They're really focused in on just responding to alerts on a daily basis because of the hundreds that are coming in. They don't really have the ability to think forward and really put a plan in place. They're just so overwhelmed by the alerts. They're getting burned out. Uh, there's so much on their plate. And they're really only focused on one organization. What the benefit of Arctic Wolf, we have 250 folks in our SOC. They're constantly talking to each other. They're sharing best practices. They can see what's happening uh, across 2,000 customers in our database, and we're correlating that all together. Um, so we're getting the best of both worlds where you know, these guys aren't burning out. They've got a very manageable workload. They're capped at a certain point so that they don't take on more customers so that we can perform our job and meet our SLAs and those types of things. But um, they also get 20% of their time to go do research and development and contribute awesome. to the SOC. So um, there, there's avenues for them outside of just looking at alert after alert on a daily basis to keep them engaged with the team, to keep the mind share going back across all of those 250 SOC analysts so that um, they're getting better each day versus just being siloed in on just responding to alerts over and over again. Absolutely. And, and again, you might have and probably have fantastic employees. And, and like you said, they're jack of all trades. They're, you know, overworked and, and maybe burnt out and whatever else. And to throw something like this on top of them, right, a living, breathing security operations center is, is just such a, a greater load. 
and you might have like the best network administrator, Sally Smith or something like that in the world, right? And the illustration is, is that Michael Jordan, right? Probably one of the best basketball players in the world, if not, right? Then he goes to play baseball, doesn't do so hot, right? So you might have the best network person, storage person, whatever person, identity person, and then you try to put them in a role like this and it doesn't always translate so well. So like Greg said, I think you guys have been around since 2012, right, Arthur Wolf? 219% growth year after year, 2,000 customers, right? They've had, what, eight years to refine what you guys are doing? Even the enterprises, I don't think, can accomplish that. Back to our triple th threat that we talked about in the beginning. So again, the, the AI and the ML and stuff, it's a supplement. Um, this is a video that you can look up on YouTube to kind of drive this home with an analogy or with an illustration. And this guy over in Europe, he asks his Alexa, hey, is it gonna snow today in London? And Alexa comes back and says, absolutely not. And it's snowing outside, right? Alexa had, had to hit like two data points to figure out if it was gonna snow that day. Didn't happen. Imagine thousands of logs coming in in a second trying to make sense of that chaos. Okay, here's the game changer, the differentiator, the disruptor, whatever you want to call it, right? The concierge security team. So whether it's do-it-yourself SOC and you're forgetting about the ops there, or whether you're with a SOC as a service client or, or a, a company today, you got to ask yourself again, what's the customer service like? You know, we meet with a lot of customers. We hear stories about, you know, maybe they're with a SOC as a service company today. And the SOC as a service will see some type of event and then they just kind of throw it over the fence and say, good luck with that. Would you mind kind of expanding on that a little bit, Greg or Logan? Yeah, I mean, and, and, and you look at the products too and it's the same thing. If a product throws you an alert, wouldn't it be great if you could go back and ask that product why they sent you that alert um, to actually get on the phone with them and say, hey, why did you flag this? What did you see that, that's what you can do with the Arctic Wolf team. They're a, they're a phone call away. You can literally call them whenever you want. Um, if you see a new strain of ransomware malware that you're concerned about, they can consult with you. They can talk you through what you should be doing as a company. We actually, as part of the uh, service, do something that we call security posture in-depth reviews where we're sitting down with you and trying to roadmap what your security program, what your security posture as a whole should look like long-term and where you can fill some gaps that you have right now. Um, our goal is to reduce the amount of noise that's coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes our service more efficient, and that's our end goal. We want to protect our customers. We're out there fighting the good fight against cybercrime, and so, um, you know, I think, you know, pulling it back to just lobbing it over the fence and uh, not really providing context around what that looks like. We'll get on with you. We'll walk you through what we saw, why we sent the alert over, uh, have a 99.99% uh, success rate in determining true positives versus false positives. So uh, by and large, when we're sending you a ticket, something's going on, something that um, you, you either need to take action on or uh, you need to be aware of something that you need to clean up. We're not sending over these alerts that are, just have no merit uh, and are false and you know just overwhelming you on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about you know, kind of the number of tickets. We have a few slides towards the end um, just to kind of give you an idea of what that workload would look like for your team. Yeah, just to add on to that too, I think when you talk about the, the SOC process, it's one thing to be notified that there's something wrong, but you know, understanding the, the full scope of the event, what's been impacted, who's been impacted, how did this happen, when did this happen, that's why broad visibility is so important because you need the context. You need to be able to paint the picture of what, what's happening across your entire environment. Um, Office 365, G Suite in, in the cloud, uh, with your network, with your endpoints, with your on-premise data. Um, so we're looking at, at everything so that when we do see a potential indication of compromise, we can expand on that, do the validation work, which is, in my mind, the hard part. Yes. Um, and then provide that, that security outcome is what we call them. So very focused on providing security outcomes. And another amazing attribute about the Arctic Wolf SOC as a service concierge team is that you actually get to know, you have dedicated people to your account. So you get to know them by name. It's not like somebody is calling you in the middle of the night and you don't know who it is and they get, have to get to know you and you have to get to know them and you're like, you know, do you understand our environment or what's going on? This is all done ahead of time. So when I think of the concierge security team with Arctic Wolf SOC as a service, I really think of the white glove treatment. And here's kind of the components of it, right? The coverage, 
the strategic thinking and the expertise. Can you guys talk about maybe the, the strategic component of that, for example? I mean, it sounds like you kind of help the customer um, maybe tactically, but also kind of strategically say, hey, if you guys take a look, you know, maybe you need a little bit more here with, um, uh, you know, maybe email security or endpoints not looking so hot or something like that. Yeah, and I think that kind of comes down to that security posture in-depth review that I mentioned, and it's, you know, because we have such broad visibility, we're able to see what's going across, you know, across your entire network. We're able to see when uh, eight, nine of your employees have clicked on phishing links, and you know, maybe you don't have two-factor authentication in place today. Maybe you haven't gone through phishing training. You know, that's an opportunity that we can come back to you and show you this is why you need it because people are clicking on things they shouldn't. Here's some things that could potentially prevent that moving forward. There's a couple of different options that you have, and High Point provides a lot of those services as well. Uh, so that what, that's what works really nice in the partnership is uh, some of the pieces that we don't cover, we're really just focused on that uh, security operations piece, but not necessarily the, the pen testing, the, the you know, other security services, the phishing test, uh, managed phishing, manage firewall, those types of things, that's where High Point can step in and come, kind of uh, provide this complete picture uh, for all the different aspects within your environment and, and take it to the next step. And we work hand in hand. High Point gets involved on calls. We're on calls with you guys as the customer. Uh, so it's just a nice, better together story uh, where we're able to kind of guide you through that security journey versus having to go it alone. And the beautiful part about that, right, is that eventually, you know, the, the CIO, the CFO, the board, whoever it is, you're gonna to have to justify a need for a Palo Alto or a ClearPass or, or a Mimecast or something like that. And if you're a data-driven, intelligence-driven organization, which you guys provide through the telemetry, then you can actually go to them and say, hey, we believe that this control is justified because of the number of, of threats and so forth that we see. And then the other beautiful part of that, right, is that once you partner with Arctic Wolf, right, then you get all the baseline numbers and you put different controls in place through the consulting, then you can come back like a year later and say, okay, CFO, CIO, board, look at the numbers now and look how they've been reduced as, a, as far as the intelligence goes from Arctic Wolf coupled with the products and consulting and services and so forth that you get with high point networks. And from a financial perspective, it justifies the whole thing. So I think that's a really important uh, attribute to consider there. Uh, we kind of just, just float over this, but coverage, right, the 24-7, the rapid response. What's kind of your response like? Do you guys kind of have like an like a average time or mean time to, to response that you could kind of hit on? Yeah, so um, internally we have a, a five-minute SLA, and obviously we have you know, time built in to do... Five minutes, folks. Five minutes. Not 242 days or 220 days. Exactly. Um, so five minutes internally, and a lot of times it's quicker than that. You know, obviously we want to do proper investigation, uh, look at those indicators of compromise before we just send over an alert, and that's meant to reduce the noise. Uh, a lot of times, you know, if it's very blatant and obvious, we're, we're responding to things within seconds of seeing it. Uh, if we can validate it that quickly, our uh, response to the customer is within 30 minutes. Uh, so that's you know, the from ticket creation to getting, reaching out to you, letting you know that there's something that has taken place. A lot of times it's a lot quicker than that. It's in the minutes range, the you know, three, four, five minutes, there is that buffer built in. Um, but if at any point in time you just don't feel there's something that doesn't look quite right in your network, you're uncomfortable with something, and an employee just came to you and told you they clicked on a link and they don't know what that link was, they think they're probably in trouble, and um, we have a five minute emergency response time. So if you reach out to us within five minutes, someone's gonna be calling you back if they don't pick up right away. You'll be on the phone with somebody and they'll walk you through, they'll, they'll look at the, all the details and the data that we have on the back end, uh, and you're on live with somebody. You don't have to sit in a queue, you don't have to go through various levels of support. Uh, so the response is immediate and it's meant to feel like you're going walking down two cubes over and talking to your IT team internally, an extension of your team. Uh, so that's kind of the look and feel of working with Arctic Wolf and the response times that you'll get. Wow, I didn't realize that emergency component of that. That's really interesting. There's so much to it. I learn something new <laughs> every time, right? Um, and then the expertise, right? So we've been through that. The, the professionals there, they're all certified CISSP ethical hackers. 
uh, risk managers, information security managers, right? Obviously, the threat hunting. Um, I think I'm going to go back to your slide. I think of the concierge security team. Um, actually, I hope I missed that one, but kind of James Bondish, right? They have the license to go out there and hunt. They have the license to kind of kill the threats and the bad guys. Filtering out the noise of the strategy, we talked about the posture there, the named advisor, so you're not talking to a stranger. And obviously the security journey guidance. They're there for the long run, tactically and strategically. Okay, this is the last slide, just gonna take like 60 seconds and then we'll get into the war stories, which I'm gonna, I haven't heard them. I'm, I'm excited about this. Time to value, right? With a do-it-yourself sock, and again, that is completely justified and an excellent option for a certain organization, right? A lot of times, the traditional folks, they, again, flexible as far as, you know, financial resources go, and it might take them six, nine months a year to just kind of get that technology up and running, and then maybe another three, six, nine, 12 months to get the operations right. With Arctic Wolf, it happens rapidly, and I know that this text is too small to see, I'm sorry, but the intent of this is to kind of see the laundry list of things that need to be done before you're really hitting pace with the traditional SIM component, traditional SOC deployment versus Arctic Wolf. Arctic Wolf, right? You meet, you do the contract, you do the, the easy predictable pricing, you meet your named security team, or at least the, the concierges to access everybody else behind it. You deploy some agents, sensors, endpoint. You onboard the logs, the telemetry. You work with Arctic Wolf to do any type of you know, customizations. The end user learns about the dashboards and stuff like that. And I forgot an item, which is probably, you know, go get a latte or something like that, right? Do it yourself. Horrible, you know, painful trying to forecast the thing. You gotta ins install all of the infrastructure, bring the log sources in, training on how to use the thing, training on how to maintain the thing, lifelong tuning, it's a living, breathing thing. You might have to build qu custom queries, you know, us usually regex or some type of, type of NoSQL now. Um, custom alarms, and then, then after all of that, then you get into the operations, which is, is so tough itself. So anyway, guys, that's time to value. I'm gonna switch over to war stories now. Uh, Greg, I'll give you a mic so both of you guys have a mic. But in the meantime, guys, again, the conversation continues. We're gonna show the slide at the end as well. Um, but I, I did a couple podcasts with Matt over here from uh, Arctic Wolf. We probably have another hour and a half of content on our YouTube channel. So check it out there. Go to highpointnetworks.com to check that out. All right, let's get into war stories. Should I hand the clicker over also? Okay. So before we jump in here, just to, to backtrack a little bit on the onboarding process. Uh, so time to value for a traditional sim, unfortunately, too often it's uh, never or a moving target just because of the complexity and how much time goes into it. Um, so normally there's a lot of pain around those conversations if we're talking to someone that, that has a, a sim or has invested in a sim because of everything else that, that goes into uh, getting value out of that tool. So I, I've heard 18 months, I've heard a year, I've heard never, I've heard it's a stop, uh, you know, to open our door. With Arctic Wolf, 100% uh, you are going to be configured day one. So we actually build in an onboarding duration, 30 to 45 days, so that we have full visibility day one. We're delivering value day one. Um, in our customer base, which we have close to 2,000 customers, uh, when we're onboarding uh, the, our clients, we've found that 70% have a latent threat in their environment. So immediately, which is basically within 90 days of them coming over to Arctic Wolf. So that's pretty substantial and kind of the proof is in the pudding there. Yeah, and I think to add to that too, when we talk about, you know, it's an operations problem, it's not a tools problem. I think that's case in point. Seven out of 10 customers that we go into, they have tools in place. They've made significant investments in security, yet seven out of 10 of them have latent threats that are just sitting there that haven't been discovered and um, you know I think it all comes back to this over dependency on the set it and forget it mentality and not having that visibility of what's going on you, you don't know what you don't have visibility into and that's kind of the scary thing 
So from a war story standpoint, we have a ton of war stories, we have a ton of examples, we see all sorts of different threats. I think that's one of the, the key elements of having the war stories is to, to just show our partners, our uh, prospective clients that there are so many different ways that a bad actor can get in and we're really at the front lines of that. Um, it's not just phishing, it's not just ransomware. Although they remain very prevalent, um, the war stories do a good job of kind of just showing you new light as far as, uh, hey, maybe I wasn't thinking about this aspect or maybe I wasn't thinking about my employees internally here. Um, so the first, yeah, so um, before we kind of dive into individual war stories, uh, we actually just came out yesterday with the security operations report. Um, so we'll, we have that full report available, but basically what it is, it's a, a view into what we're seeing across our 2,000 customers in terms of security incidents, in terms of security vulnerabilities, um, and how that's changed as a result of COVID and how that landscape has shifted just in the last six months. So. Uh, it's some great read, it's very compelling stuff. We just heard about it yesterday. Um, but uh, Mark Manglamot is our VP of Security Services. Um, this, it all goes back to the operations and having that component in place. But just to give you a sense of uh, you know, what we're seeing. So in Q2 of 2020, 35% uh, of the, the security incidents we saw happened between uh, 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. So when we talk about why 24 by seven monitoring is important and that the bad actors don't sleep, there's proof right there, 35%. Uh, if you would have asked us three years ago, um, we had this stat back then, it was about 10% of the incidents, most of them were user driven. Um, we're starting to see more and more attacks that are launched post business hours, uh, and it's even more crucial to have that 24 by seven monitoring piece it's in place. In the middle of the day where they're at. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, other important uh, key piece here, we see uh, 100 billion daily observations, so just, uh, gives you kind of the scale of, of what we're seeing as a company. We're actually one of uh, AWS's biggest customers. Uh, just by the sheer amount of data that we're ingesting and our platforms built up in AWS. Uh, of those, uh, 100 billion observations, on average we're seeing less than uh, five incidents per week created for our customers. Uh, so you, you look at a traditional SIM tool and, and if someone were to tell you you'll see five incidents per week, they'll tell you that it's probably broken if it's, if it's the SIM tool that you're mining. They're getting hundreds, in some cases thousands, that they're weeding through. For us, for you know, like a 500 user company, we'll see about 765 what we call um, investigations per week that our team is going into and manually looking at. And of that, we'll see you know, between three and five ticketed incidents or things that we're reaching out to you about to take a look at. Um, so drastically reducing that noise, you know, maintaining that efficacy in our tickets that we are sending to you to make sure that we're not sending you junk, it's real actionable stuff. Yeah, just real quick there too, there's, there's a lot of value in that information too if we're not bringing it to a security incident, but uh, we did investigate, um, you know, that, that's an area where we're gonna wanna look at it. If we're spending 70% of our time investigating a specific attack, uh, that's gonna spark kind of that proactive conversation. What do we do to prevent this from happening or, or to shore up this coverage here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Another important stat, uh, the time it uh, takes to deploy patches for vulnerabilities has increased by 40 days. Um, I think you know if you're working in IT, you know the amount of patches that you have to apply, you know how that list can grow if you're not keeping up with it on a consistent basis. Uh, it's becoming tenfold with the increase of attacks that we're seeing with COVID to the point where it's taking an extra 40 days to keep up with that. And as you get behind, it's 40 days now, you know, two, three months from now, it could be 50 days, 60 days as these things keep piling up. So uh, the importance of prioritizing your patching, which is done through our managed risk service and through High Point, uh, is, is very crucial as well to limit the avenues that bad actors have to get in. 64% uh, increase in ran ransomware and phishing attempts uh, in just over the last quarter. So within three months, a 64% increase. 429% uh, increase on account takeover. Uh, so compromised uh, credentials that are out there on the web. We actually have, uh, we do dark web scanning. We call it account takeover risk protection where we're looking uh, for things outside of your, not, not only your infrastructure, your, your uh, IaaS uh, as well, but looking for just out there on the dark web, you guys have passwords that have been compromised. Could they potentially use those to log in as you within Office 365? So it looks like a valid login. And that's part of our war stories. There's so many times where that happens where someone uses the same password over and over again. Uh, they find their Yahoo password, it's the same password they use at work, 
they log in, it's pretty easy to figure out an email domain. Um, they type that in and away they go and they're, they're looking just like a, a normal login. Um, and then the last piece is just uh, connecting to open Wi-Fi networks. So Wi-Fi networks that aren't secured. Uh, as this remote workforce continues, uh, as people aren't going into their secured networks at their work, maybe they're working from coffee shops, uh, even prior to that, you know, working in airports, working on their home networks that aren't secured because they just haven't thought to do that. Um, it just increases the likelihood that someone could get on that network and you know, do whatever they want, get, you know, compromise that end user's laptop, uh, VPN or get back into the, the main network and, and you know that business is in trouble and, and someone just let them walk right in the door because they logged into an unsecured network. So that's just you know what we're seeing. So the key themes, uh, just the, the forced dispersion of, of people working remotely. Uh, ransomware remains a key threat. Uh, again, two years ago, we saw a decrease in ransomware. Uh, it was mainly phishing that we were seeing. Uh, two years ago, that's evolved. Ransomware has kind of made this uh, spike back up when we're seeing a lot more of it and a lot of times it is combined with a, a phishing attack initially and then it spurns into ransomware over time once they get in and, and are able to launch. Um, traditional patching timelines are no longer acceptable. If, if you're not doing it in a timely manner, it's going to continue to add up and, uh, and, and prolong the, uh, the amount that you need to do over time if you push it off a day or two or a week or two. Uh, misconfigurations in the cloud are uh, uh, in cloud environments are leaving people vulnerable. I think what we find a lot of is that uh, companies just don't have expertise in the cloud. They, they're moving there, they, they want to go there, that's the way everyone's going, but they haven't had experience there. They don't know what security measures they have to have in place. Uh, maybe Azure or AWS, you think you're safe there because they're a large organization, they probably have security figured out. 47% of the incidents we detect have a cloud component to them, and that tells you otherwise. Uh, there's a lot of misconfigurations up there, so if you're moving into the cloud, you have moved into the cloud, have you done what you need to do to make sure that piece of your network is secure? Um, and then just remaining vigilant in the face of, of account takeover attacks. Um, make sure your employees are changing their passwords. Make sure their passwords aren't uh, in plain text and it's not a uh, password that's their pa The most commonly used password is password. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, just having, having those conversations and having that awareness for your company is going to do a lot and making sure they're not continuing to reuse the same password uh, is going to prevent a lot of those um, instances where they're using that to log in from a, from a business perspective. Um, and then this is just, you know, some advice from, from our security operations team that we'll give to all organizations and whether you use High Point or Arctic Wolf or not, this is just good, common, best security practices. Um, establishing monitoring and detection in depth across your entire environment. So basically looking at everything within your environment and making sure that you have awareness into what's going on, not leaving any blind spots. That's usually where you get that 240 days that a threat's sitting in your environment. So um, having that visibility is crucial. Uh, developing and implementing a response, a service level agreement internally. Um, so you having, having a plan, uh, especially around high value assets. So what are you really trying to protect? If something were to happen, have a plan in place, have certain SLAs in place to make sure that when, when and if something does happen, uh, you know how to respond to that so you're not scrambling around um, and this is the first time it's come up. Uh, conducting cyber exercises, so doing uh, like a red team or a, a, a pen test, doing an a, a executive level tabletop exercise, maybe simulating an attack uh, and seeing how, what that process looks like throughout your company. Uh, again, just so it's not the first time it's come up, you know the drill, when you come through it, practice makes perfect. Uh, you can't expect to get it right when it's just popping up and it's the first time you've dealt with it. Um, and then remediate vulnerabilities uh, based on severity and frequency. Uh, I think this is why that list continues to grow and why it is 40 days is because you just get that laundry, laundry list of vulnerabilities that you need to take care of and it, you don't really know well, which one do I tackle first. Make sure you're prioritizing those, get the critical patches done first and knock those out so the ones that can be taken care of at a later date that aren't as crucial um, don't bog you down in the meantime and make sure you're really prioritizing that piece. Cool. So we'll walk through just a, a couple samples here, and if uh, anyone's interested, we, we have a lot of war stories. We have public case studies, analyst reports. Happy to provide that information. So this is one of the more common uh, you know, breaches or security incidents that we're seeing is around uh, email being compromised, uh, to Greg's point here. 
but I wanted to share this one because it's a little close to, close to home for me because I actually was working on this opportunity. Um, they were not looking at adding a, a SOC or a SIM. They were just looking at adding a, a peripheral security technology in IDS, IPS. Um, and during the conversation, we uncovered that they were having some activity on their Office 365 that was suspicious. They were losing emails. Something wasn't right. Um, it was definitely concerning from, from our standpoint. And uh, we got a call from them five days after that meeting to say, we need you guys in here tomorrow to meet with us. We've been breached. Our CFO has been breached. We sent $700,000 to a man in the middle attacker who had basically taken over uh, both emails and they were acting as the recipient and the sender. CFO sent the 700K. And with, with their war stories, you don't always get to see the, the payday or the end result, you know, because we're, we're stopping a potential compromise from happening. In this case, they weren't yet a client, um, but they signed up within 12 days total, start to finish talking to them. So I've been a part of three of those scenarios. Uh, they're not, not pretty, it's not fun to have conversations around uh, losing money or your environment being breached, et cetera, but uh, very relevant. It's happening every single day. That was, uh, we actually have a success story to this point. It was a very similar scenario where we were in place um, and in, in that case, uh, a CFO uh, had clicked on a link. Uh, he downloaded, he had, his business credentials were compromised, somebody was acting as him. As this is unfolding, we're, we're reaching out to him, we're telling him, he's saying, no, we've got two-factor authentication in place, we're fine. He hits it in his pocket, he just wants to quiet the noise down, he accepts it, bad actors in. Um, they start making changes in rule boxes, we continue to reach out to him and tell him, hey, you've got to stop this. Um, we prevented, the, they had teed up uh, an email to go out requesting that wire transfer. I believe this one was around 750, 800K. Um, and we stopped it from happening. They shut down the account. Nothing was ever sent out. Uh, in this particular instance, they were, this was in Office 365. Microsoft reached out to them three days later telling them, you guys, you maybe have some activity going on. So uh, the, the Moral of the story is that active response time, that quick response time, it can't be days. If it would have been hours later, they would have sent that wire transfer out. Uh, by having Arctic Wolf in place, we were able to f see that activity within eight minutes, even when the customer was telling us, no, we're fine. We don't take that as a, as a good answer. No, you're not fine. Um, we can pretty clearly see that you're not fine. You need to go do something about it. So we, we alerted them appropriately. A couple examples here, um, you know, we've seen a World of Warcraft, but we've seen uh, activity like this where a server is spun up uh, on, a, on a company, in a company environment. Um, it, it could be worse, it could be something besides a game. They were just looking to, to take basically CPU usage and storage. Um, but that could have taken down a, a critical, um, you know, component of their business uh, if, if there was any downtime associated with someone hacked in so that they could use their computer, their CPU, their RAM uh, for that game. So I just, I, I like to kind of show different sides of, of ways that we might catch a potential hacker and, and this one's interesting to me. And an, another one that I heard about recently too was um, before we were in place, uh, this was a company that had cybersecurity insurance and so they were pretty reliant on that should something happen. Uh, again, it was a spear phishing attack where uh, they got in through someone that clicked on something they shouldn't. You'll hear that's a common theme. Uh, we, we see that a lot as a way to get in, and that's why the tools, you know, you can't stop users from acting. Uh, if, you know, they're not informed on, they're not prepared to not click on things they shouldn't. I think of my dad who has been in construction his entire life, and uh, he was telling me the other day that he clicked on the heart pills that were on the side. He's getting older, he wanted to feel younger again, and he clicked on them and put his information in, and I said, Dad, what are you doing? Uh, so there's, there's those employees across all these organizations, and, and that's what happened here. Uh, they got in, they took over, they, they took down uh, their firewalls, they took down every defense mechanism that they had in place, they got admin rights, uh, they encrypted everything, and Sure, the, the, the ransom was paid, the cyber insurance company helped them with paying that ransom and they were covered from that regard, but they lost everything. They lost all of their data and that wasn't covered in their cyber insurance that they had. So you know, the point there is really read the fine print. 
uh, on, on what's actually covered and don't just assume that everything's protected, that it's like, you know, if you get in a car crash, your, your car's gonna be covered. There's, there's hidden components to it and there's certain pieces that you have to have in place in order to be fully covered. Uh, so really make sure you're reading through that, really make sure you have those pieces in place so you are covered. Um, and we hear from our customers all the time that their premiums go down by having us in place because they're less of a risk. Um, you know, if you have better measures in pay place, better controls in place, uh, you're more easily insured. The same way if you get, uh, you know, a few DWIs on your record, you're, you're a, more of a risk, uh, your premiums go up. So it's um, all things to consider uh, when you're looking at cyber insurance. And we've even heard of cyber insurance companies that uh, are actually doing a vulnerability scan, an external scan prior to even providing coverage for a company. They wanna know um, who they're insuring and what their networks looks like before they're gonna cover it. And I think we're gonna continue to see that more and more and uh, see that across business as well. So uh, the same way that you look at a credit score, I think companies are gonna start looking at your security score as to whether or not they're gonna do business with you, as to whether or not they're gonna invest in you. Uh, so I continue to see this you know, growing throughout time as, as things evolve here. This is basically to, to show that the, the reporting and the data that we have is empirical evidence to make business decisions uh, to help with compliance. Um, we have examples where the, the data or the reporting that we send our client is helping with um, you know, IT functions, operational um, projects such as you know, lowering FTP traffic. So there's a lot of good ways to use this data, certainly to try and get approval for a, a project, be able to show that, you know, hey, we're spending 70% of our time on potential phishing, maybe look at MFA, having that empirical evidence is, is key. Um, so this is one where uh, they were going through an audit, the, the auditor came in and basically spun up a username, password in their system, uh, credentials basically, as a third party contractor. We caught this right away, we notified them, and before the contractor was even walking in the, the customer's site, they walked up to him and said, "This, we can't have this, you need to, to log out Arctic, we'll caught it. He was like, wow, he signed off on the, the, the audit. So that's a different way to, to look at the, the data that we're capturing and outside of the, the tactical service, day-to-day -day service. Awesome, thanks a lot guys. It's really interesting to hear some of those stories because I think a lot of us can relate to those, you know, whether we've uh, been a victim of an incident or have come close or uh, talking about the different, you know, verticals that, that incidences have happened in and especially the cost, right? If something were to happen, right? The cost of the control in these situations, obviously much, much less than the cost of the incident. The cyber insurance, Maybe they've paid for the ransomware, but what about the reputational impact, right? Very interesting. So guys, we have about 15 minutes left for Q&A with Arctic Wolf, SOC as a Service. And for our many visitors that are joining us online uh, from all over the United States, I believe that we're gonna try to field some questions um, in real time uh, through, the, through the hybrid virtual connection. And then obviously for those that are attending here in person today, and thank you for doing that. And we're all sitting six feet apart and practicing, that's fantastic. Um, but we welcome your questions as well. Um, if we get some online, I'll repeat those questions so everybody's uh, aware of what they're asking. And, and uh, Brandy, our producer back here, maybe we'll ask her if we have any questions submitted. Okay, no questions right now. Okay, and any questions from our audience today? Okay. Yeah, yes, sir. So the question is, is, is what, do, what does the, the cyber operations analyst, uh, concierge folks, consultants, what does that number look like? What type of employees do you, like what type of, of um, what do I want to say, capacity does Arctic Wolf have? Yeah, I can answer that. So 
Greg mentioned, we have about 250 resources in our SOC and research and development, so I'd say that's about 50 uh, resources in, in R&D. So about 200 engineers. Um, but we do have a, a division of duties or resources in our SOC, so we talk a lot about our concert security team, but we also have our interrupt-driven team, so the uh, forensic analysis, the ones that are uh, validating if there's a security incident within a minute before escalating it if they can't do so to a security engineer by then. So um, I, I believe it's about 60-40 as far as the interrupt-driven team is about 60% of that 200, um, and then 40% of the 200 for the concert security teams. And we can continue to invest in that area. So we have a big SOC located in, in Waterloo, Canada. We have another one in Provo, Utah. Uh, we just announced plans to build another one out in Minneapolis, another one in San Antonio. So uh, we're continuing to invest in that area. We know um, that's the bread and butter of our service. And um, you, know, you wouldn't recognize uh, that, that concierge feel from, we, we hear from our customers all the time, that it feels like they're only supporting us. Uh, obviously, they support multiple customers. A lot of that's dictated on uh, you know, what vertical they're in. If it's a, a large enterprise account that has 10,000 employees, they might get their own dedicated team. Uh, if it's a smaller environment, we might assign you 10, 15 customers to that security engineer, kind of depending. Uh, but we always are monitoring the workloads. So um, we track, uh, we look at the attack surface, we, we see how, much, uh, how many tickets are coming in, that type of thing, and that's monitored very closely uh, to make sure that we're maintaining our SLAs and maintaining that concierge feel to you as a customer. Two more. Yep. And a lot of, um, you know, of our SOC team is equipped to work remotely. So with COVID, uh, Toronto's pretty much shut down everything. So a lot of those teams are dispersed now. Um, so we're even looking at beyond that. And for us, it really depends on where is their security talent? Um, where can we find, you know, in, in, uh, in, in Canada, it's the University of Toronto that we're able to pull from. Uh, in, in Provo, there's a, a, a strong security practice there. We just have a heavy presence in Minneapolis. Uh, San Antonio, there's a ton of, of great resources as well. So that's kind of where we're basing decisions on where that SOC should go. Uh, but we're going to be able to expand that to be, if we can find talent and they're remote and they're not in one of those locations, we're still going to be able to incorporate them into our SOC because we've uh, built our platform out in a way where they don't have to go into this data center for us to be effective. So we can pull from many different avenues versus having to be siloed in those four locations. Yeah, and just to provide a little bit of perspective too, so, so Greg and I actually started the, the exact same day three years ago, uh, and when we came on board, there was give or take one engineer, there's 13 engineers. So we've, we've seen uh, the proof that they've scaled along with the business, going from 100 customers to, to 2,000. They're gonna continue to make those investments, like, like Greg just mentioned. Um, the biggest thing is it, is it does come down to the talent pool. I know the concern in the Twin Cities area was there's a lot of Fortune 100 companies, so pulling talent would be a little bit difficult there, but we're gonna continue to, to scale up and, and grow on the security side. Producer Brandy Vector has another question for us from uh, online. Yes. Okay. Can you kind of repeat that? So what's required of the business from their network to be connected to ours as well. I mean, does it take a, a big pipe for that telemetry to cross yeah. the land and so forth for it to be effective and timely? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we do have a physical component to our solution. It's a sensor that we're going to put at each ingress egress point at each firewall there. Uh, and that's going to act as our log aggregation. So we're going to point all the on premise log data. That's how we're capturing that in the cloud. It's also our eyes and ears into the network from a network traffic perspective. We do deploy an Arctic Wolf endpoint agent on all the devices on off the network, all the nodes. So that's going to give us even more uh, granular visibility into those devices, uh, as well as we have direct APIs into the, the Office 365s, the Azures. Yeah, so those are really the three primary ways that we're, we're pulling in data, and then it's coming into the, the same pipeline. And I'd say for us, typical onboarding time, and you know, obviously if it's a large organization that has 100 locations, it might take a little bit longer to onboard, but we've done onboarding in as little as uh, a week in certain instances where it was absolutely critical to get it deployed if you know, we kind of move at the speed of the customer. Um, so two to four weeks is our average uh, for onboarding, but it's, 
uh, you know, very light cabling exercise on that, that physical sensor, and then it's a matter of just pointing log sources to, to that sensor so that it can get adjusted up into our SIM in AWS. So um, a, another huge benefit, we have 2,000 customers. We've done this deployment 2,000 times. Uh, we have this pretty streamlined uh, versus the, you know, the, the six to nine months when you're doing it yourself. You haven't gone through it before. This is all brand new to you. We've been there. We've done it. We've seen all different types of environments so we can um, you know, push it out accordingly and help you through that process. And you do get a, a dedicated onboarding team as well. Um, so there's a project manager and then a security resource that's assigned to you during onboarding that's helped you navigate through that entire piece. Yeah, so the question was the first point of contact if you were to have a situation um, within your organization, is it Arctic Wolf or High Point Networks? So we would work with you guys and set that up during the pre-sales process to work within the cadence of um, you know, what you guys are doing today. So if you are utilizing uh, managed services through, through High Point, then um, we are gonna have them be a part of the, the service offering. They're gonna be engaged um, with the uh, unique security incidents, all the, the tickets, and we can set up the escalation path to, to have them work within those confines. Um, so it's gonna come down to preference, customer preference. We're never gonna try and corner you and do a, a specific engagement model, but we do have flexibility there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, it's really an option. Uh, if, if you want High Point to handle the first ticket, they absolutely can, they're equipped to it, they've done it before. Um, if you want to um, you have that ticket routed to you, or if you want tickets to go to both you and the High Point team, uh, we can work that all out through onboarding, really your preference on how you want to receive that ticket, how you want the High Point team involved, and how you want to work with Arctic Wolf. Right, and our, our better together relationship, our 20 year history that, that our founders have built is, I mean, we also have that white glove treatment. Mm -hmm. One of our uh, slogans here is that we're always connected. So yes, Arctic Wolf and, and High Point, we will meet you wherever you're at, whatever your preference is. So, so thank you guys. We have another question online. Oh, two more. Okay, great. Okay, the question was, is does Arctic Wolf do some type of a scan during the, the proposal or the, the pre-implementation or the pre-sales phase uh, was the question. Uh, well, it depends. So if, if that's something that, that you want to get a feel for and see a report from an external scan, we can set that up in the pre-sales process. We're not gonna run that with every environment as, as a prerequisite to, to move forward with Arctic Wolf. Um, so that would be within the first month of the actual service. But we do have some clients that have requested, hey, we wanna see what this looks like, show us a report of the, the external scan. So it is an option. And High Point Networks can, at, you know, any time help you with that if you'd like to justify maybe the control or the purpose of a security <laughs> operations center. Um, so I, I think that was maybe the, the purpose of the question, maybe some type of, of pre-analysis or pen test to, to kind of justify the, this, um, this operations, this uh, security operations as a center. All right, we have one more question. That is huge, so we have the smartest audience. Thank you online for that. The question was, is what type of ongoing reporting uh, can Arctic Wolf uh, offer? And some inside baseball, this is huge because you're gonna, I mean, do it yourself, SOC, or SOC as a service gonna have to justify that this service is working, especially like a year down the road to the chief financial officer and the board and stuff. So if you guys could hit on some reporting quick, that'd be great. Yeah, so from a reporting standpoint, we have, sorry, I got a fly buzzing around here. Um, we have a customized reporting, so really uh, whatever you need as an organization, we have the ability to adapt our reports to fit your needs. So um, those can be done on a weekly basis. They can be a, a, you know, bi-weekly, monthly, quarterly, kind of however you want to see them. Uh, we have very in-depth reports. If you want to get into the weeds a little bit, we have executive level reports. If you want to present those to the boards, we have uh, HIPAA reports, PCI reports, if you need those for uh, audit purposes. Uh, but the whole point is we have a lot of data available to us and we can dice that up however you see fit. So that's uh, one of the benefits of working with the team. You tell them what you want, that concierge security team, 
you tell them what you want and we'll put it on paper and, and maybe ask some questions around why you need that only because we maybe be able to put it into a better format that can better fit your needs because we've uh, we've provided those reports to customers we work with them for so if we know what you're asking for the report for we can kind of tailor it to your specific needs and then how do you know the service is working uh, the the concierge security team will meet with you on a monthly and quarterly basis as well um, so it's not that we're just sending reports over we're actually sitting down with you going through those reports telling you what we're seeing uh, and then doing those you know security posture in-depth reviews where we're reviewing your environment uh, we actually assign a security score uh, within our platform to see uh, you know, how responsive have you been when we've been sending tickets to you? Uh, do we have all the telemetry we need? Uh, what do things look like in your environment? And then you can see that score improve uh, over time as the service goes on as we keep having these conversations on a regular basis. Awesome. Oh, one more. This is great. Keep them coming. We'll, uh, we'll answer questions as long as you guys would like. Yeah, Brandy. Yeah, the question was, is, is there an opportunity to do a proof of concept or, or a demo? In most cases, no. Um, now we do, do, we, we do get flexible and creative with, with terms and, and doing kind of a, a trial or, or pay by trial. Um, one month, three months, whatever it may be. The biggest reason is it's because we're not, so we're not gonna you know, deploy it, you get to play around with it. Um, you know, kind of get your hands dirty for a month or two and then determine if you like it. Uh, we're dedicating resources day one, the onboarding process and throughout the, the services engagement, so there's a cost on our end. Um, but if um, that is a concern as far as, hey, there's a comfort level, do we want to make a switch? We have ways to get creative to, to make it easier for, for them. And we do have a, a demo platform. We can show you the reports that we're able to generate. We can show you what ticketing would look like. We can show you the visualization in the dashboards so you can get a feel for that. What's really hard to simulate is that interaction with the security team. Uh, but we certainly can arrange calls with our security team, so concierge security team, so you can get familiar with them. Uh, what we do a lot of too is, is customer reference calls. We have a lot of happy customers that are out there. So um, you, you, Logan and I, uh, Dean, can sit up here all day and tell you how great and wonderful the service is. Uh, but if you can hear it from a customer firsthand, unbiased opinion, we'll just let you guys, we won't even be on the call, we'll just say, you go talk to them, they've agreed that, that you can reach out to them and you can hear firsthand um, you know, their experience with the service, how it's been, what deployment looked like, uh, maybe th some things they would have done different. Uh, but you know, we, we have that as an option as well um, so that you guys can kind of get the feel from that without doing a, a full-blown POC that you might be used to on the software or the product side. It still, it still allows us to prove our value, though. Um, it says a lot to, if, if we're going out and saying we'll do a one month or a three month so you can try it out, uh, we're confident that we're gonna deliver an exceptional level of service, which is why we do that. Most SaaS companies will not do anything less than a year. How are we doing, producer Brandy? All right, great questions. I think we have, oh, yes, sir. So the question is, is as a customer, right, this is going to be as a service, and we have a lot of te telemetry that's coming in on-prem, and we have telemetry that's coming down from the cloud onto on-prem. I know there's APIs. I don't want to cloud the, the water here. But you have all of this telemetry within a person's organization, and then they essentially need to pump that up to your SIM and AWS for you guys to do the enrichment and so forth on your platform. Uh, what type of maybe pre-thought needs to go into that to ensure that the WAN pipe between on-prem and the cloud is thick enough to, to handle all that telemetry that may come across? Yeah, normally it's not an issue, but as far as talking through and making sure we're scoping it correctly, um, you know, we do have different types of sensors. So based on, um, you know, network utilization, kind of the peaks, you know, we're going to want to make sure it doesn't cross the, the threshold and we're sizing the, the sensor correctly. Um, we'll, we'll talk through all that on, 
during the conversation with the client. So what you're gonna wanna do is if you're interested, reach out to your high point rep and we'll actually set up a call to get a little bit more specific about your environment and then we can work up pricing for you. So as you go through that predictable pricing, right, we have the users and the workstations yep. and the cloud app and all of that stuff is kind of an assessment done in, in pre-sales, obviously to get price. But if you look at all of those factors, does it give you some type of idea of the amount of telemetry that might come across and therefore help a customer understand the type of bandwidth that they may, may need up to AWS SIM? So I'm not an engineer, so bear with me. Um, I can get all these answers for you. Can we follow up? Yeah, yeah. we can do that. Let's do that. Yeah. I think Brandy will probably be able to post the answer of that. Um, I think we're gonna be able to, to offer this as a replay. So for those other online customers in here in person, if you want to really know the answer to that, we'll provide that online somehow. So so we have a, a solid answer of that. We don't want to confuse anybody. Yeah, and I so um, you know we have sensors out off the coast on ships in Africa that they have limited bandwidth, and we're still able to support them. I don't know the exact numbers of what that pipeline is. I just know it hasn't been an issue, and because we're taking the metadata. Um, from the, that's what we're gathering, that's the, the, the logs that we're gathering. Uh, it's a very limited uh, bandwidth that we actually need to get that data up into AWS. Obviously, we'll dive into specifics. Um, if there's a, a, a ton of data that's coming in, you obviously are gonna need a bigger pipe. Uh, generally, larger organizations would have that. Um, if you're you know, a small you know, bank, you're a 50 person company, you're probably not gonna have as much data and because it's metadata, the, the, the pipe doesn't need to be as big. Uh, we can talk through that on a call and that will be all part of the pre-sales process when we scope to ensure that we can support you as a customer. All right, so, was there another question in the back? All right, um, so uh, really appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, as an added incentive, if you wanna learn more, uh, we are offering a $75 gift card to Omaha Steaks for taking a 30 minute meeting with Arctic Wolf and High Point. Uh, so really, you know, what's at stake with your security? What do your security operations look like? Uh, so to have a more in-depth discussion, take 30 minutes, uh, we'll send you that $75 gift card. So contact your High Point rep uh, for more details, and we are happy to get that coordinated and set up. Awesome, and then one more slide. All right, we'd like to thank everybody for joining today, those online all over the United States and those that joined here in person today. It was great to have our kind of first face-to-face -face type of, of uh, conference or seminar uh, since, the, since the spring of 2020. Um, please go to highpointnetworks.com or YouTube slash highpointnetworks.com. We have another hour and a half of Arctic Wolf contact, or content there. And then we will also be uh, answering that question um, probably in show notes or something like that as, as you view the event again. So again, on behalf of Arctic Wolf and High Point Networks and our Better Together relationship, we hope to continue the conversation with you in person, online, via email, whatever you guys would like. All right, adios, have a great day everybody.